Welcome to another uh, podcast from the Straight Talking Property Podcast crew. Got a Brett of Legra Wood on today. We've got Emmanuel Ezekiel, myself, hey Ashley Banfield, and we've got Michael Fraser from Beat the Burglar, amongst many other things, I'm sure. So, welcome, boys. Welcome, Brett. Welcome. Yeah. Awesome. Good. Still in Singapore. Good man. Emmanuel, welcome. How you doing, mate? Good. And welcome, Michael. Thank you. Michael, can you just give us a quick introduction for those listening, and there'll be people watching the video as well, uh, as to sort of, you know, your background, how you got into, you know, your most famous show, Beat the Burger, and what else you're doing since then? Yes, uh, my name's Michael Fraser. Um, I grew up in care, children's homes. Um, and the thing about being in care you have quite harsh, but you have a couple of choices. You either become part of a gang or you're bullied physically, mentally, um, unless you happen to be a phys physically strong person. Mm. Um, I became part of a gang, and what we used to do is um, it is peer pressure. You are pushed into it. Um, what we would do is go out and actually break into properties. Now, that could be houses, flats, cars. Um, the thing about being in care is that you've got a, what's called a care order on you. So you tend to have a little bit more protection against serious offences because you are actually in care. Um, it doesn't mean you, you're not punished because they can put you into what's called an assessment centre. And an assessment centre is actually somewhere where they're going to report on uh, behavioural patterns, uh, attitude. Um, the biggest thing about being in care is um, I was in care from the age of two up to 18. And... Oh, wow you tend to be able to soak up what they're handing out or they're trying to do and you can read into them. So you start assessing the stuff and manipulating it to suit yourself um, because that's what it, it's all about. It's trying to read the person, watching behavioural patterns, body language. And I think, you know, anybody in care actually learns to pick it up themselves. At 18, I was released. The care order is closed. You are then put out. And I actually was given a one-bedroomed flat and told to get on with life. You don't have a social worker. You have nothing you're just thrown out and you get out there. Um, all through care, I was breaking into different properties. Um, I got caught for receiving stolen goods. Um, and I actually stole a ring from a jewelry shop and I gave it to somebody who actually took it to the police. They arrested me. And at 17, I've gone back, sorry, 17, my social worker said to me, which was probably the best thing ever, you're on your way to prison. And that absolutely terrified me. It sounds strange. I'd grown up in institutions all my life, yeah. but I knew prison was the end. Um, you've got to remember we're going back to the late 70s. Um, oh, wow. I didn't want to go to prison. Uh, I was absolutely terrified. So I decided to go out and get a job. Um, and I went to quite a few different places. And one place I went to, the guy who interviewed me, he was uh, a director of the company, um, not a shareholder. It's, it's important to explain he was a director, but in name only. Uh, he ran the Birmingham operation of a London company. 
and uh, lovely guy, but he had his doubts because he had never actually had any sort of inter interaction with a black person or a coloured person or whatever you want to put it. He was from a place called T Teesside up north and he'd never had any sort of interaction with a coloured person. And I think he was quite intrigued. Anyway, he interviewed me for a job as a labourer and my interview was at 8 a.m. in the morning. I went in for the interview at 8 um, told him I could do anything, I was willing to work, I really need the job. Um, he said, I will let you know by the end of the day. I've got a, quite a few other interviews. And I said, great. I went back at nine o'clock. I said, have you thought about it? Have you decided? He said, look, I'll let you know at the end of the day. And I said, great. I went back at 10, 11. And because of my persistence, he gave me the job. I wanted the job because going to court, if you are actually working, it gave you a better chance to stay out of uh, being locked up. Yeah. So I took the job on, um, worked my heart out at it, um, got on really well with the boss, and um, he actually put me on a machine, quite boring, monotonous, um, and what it did is actually cut locks out in door frames. And uh, he was very good in the sense he used to say to me, right, if you can do 20 today, I'll give you a bonus. So me, I would do 30. Then it go up, go up to, can you do 40? Bet you can't do 40. Of course, me, I did 50. Now, this went on for a while, and um, I used to turn out quite a few of these door frames. Very boring, very monotonous, but I used to do it and just mm. trying to achieve new targets every day. I then decided to leave because I asked my boss for a rise, and he said he couldn't afford it. And he bought, I'm a car person, and he bought a Jaguar, well, the company did for him, from a, an Allegro. He had an Austin Allegro, uh, and he jumped up to a Jaguar. Uh, there was too much of a jump for me to say he couldn't afford to give me a rise. So I said I was leaving, and he said, no, don't leave. What about going self-employed? And what you can do for every door frame you make, I will give you 60 pence. I said, yes, I jumped at the chance and he gave me the keys to the unit and the office. Massive, massive trust in giving me them yeah. keys. Uh, I went in, I used to turn out door frames. I'd start at four in the morning, finish at 11, 12 at night. And I was turning out hundreds of these door frames and he was paying me 60 pence for each one. Um, in the meantime, I was taking phone calls after work off customers, um, interacting with customers. A uh, customer would come on and say, hi, could you get me 20 of these door frames done for two days? I'd say, yes, uh, put it in my little book and I'd do it in a day. I was always trying to impress. I'd do yeah. it in a day. And I'd phone them back and that praise was unbelievable for me one of his customers called me in to see them and sat me down and said look why don't you do your own business um we won't fund you but we will back you um and we can't pay you no more than six pound per frame now not being an accountant but six pounds per frame yeah. did you say from six pound to six pounds. Yeah, not being an accountant, but I knew it was a hell of a lot more. Had another no uh, Jeez. And I set up a business doing manufacturing. Um, I started employing people. Um, and what I would do would be 25% of the staff. I employed 100 staff in the end. 
25 uh, percent wow. of the staff uh, were ex-offenders. I'm not a do-gooder. I just know it's ever so difficult. I know people say a leopard can't change their spots, but I believe you give someone a chance, they will try and do something better. They've got to move out of their environment and, you know, be focused and guided. And like I said, I wasn't a do-gooder because if you failed, I'd just throw you out of the company. You'd lost your, your opportunity to go forward. Uh, this became quite a big news thing because I became a millionaire uh, and I was taken on ex well, sorry, Michael, what, what Sorry, Michael, what sort of age was this that you sort of hit millionaire status? 23. Wow. Awesome. Um, I was invited on <clears throat> quite a few different programs on TV to talk to people, ex-offenders, uh, giving my view, helping, advising, and um, I also was invited on the board of a charity called Apex, which is based in London. Uh, they help ex-offenders get into work. Um, I do talks in prisons, schools, approved schools, assessment centres, um, basically telling my story. Now, that was all a success. Um, we The company was doing around six million a year. Um, I was very successful and I stood back because I'd got married, even though that went wayside. Um, I then started getting involved in TV work and that's like Beat the Burglar, uh, Catch a Thief, yeah. Going straight, and all these programs were basically around um, uh, catch a thief was the same as beat the burglar. Really, what you do, you've got the presenter who walks into the house, he introduces himself, talks to the homeowners, and he says to them, "How safe do you think your house is out of ten? And surprisingly, most people are between seven and nine. Um, and then they would sit in um, a, 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 a little van with monitors in and I would have a jump cam on and the house would be all cameras and I'd break in different ways to show them how weak the security was. Um, I would also have this sort of... Um, it was really to anger the people get them angry I would do something like eat something out of the fridge and toss a chicken leg over my shoulder um this is something I brought into the program um yeah. I would take uh, a wedding album um and then I never got to meet these people until after the actual burglary mm. and then they would have to come into their living room and I would be standing there waiting to greet them. And I ho always had this thing where I would put my arms behind my back and I would slightly tilt my head forward. And it's amazing how people react to that because you're looking quite vulnerable and also mm. ashamed of yourself. And that gives people more anger to attack which they did not physically but they would come in and go mad and yeah, say yeah. why have you stole the wedding photos and i'd say perhaps you'd want to buy them back if they're that important to you and that would really get them going so it's quite a powerful impact on the victim and it was all down to well if you're not going to secure your property this is actually the reality of what's going to happen and, you know, they'd say, well, you know, you've uh, actually took the, thrown the chicken leg over your shoulder. Who the hell do you think you are? And it was really to get them yeah. going. So it was quite a, a really good impact uh, program. Um, to sort of shock them, if you like, into reality. I yeah, shock them. Yeah, into reality of what actually was. And I always remember, if you walk around someone's property, I've got a habit of walking around and... 
it's so easy to find the personality of the person by walking around the property. It'd be difficult to do that in Ashley's house. <laughs> well, the one property hey? I broke. I said it'd be difficult to do it in your house. It, you've got no personality. It's all being done. That's <laughs> <laughs> lovely, isn't it? I understand what you mean, though. I understand what you mean because, yeah. you know, you can see behind Brett now. You can't hear it on the podcast, but you can you can see a lot from behind <laughs> Brett if you can see him, Michael about uh, his personality. Uh, it's, it's well, I mean, I'm in the I'm in the mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> Three plus one, yeah. <laughs> and his little toys. But yeah, you can, you can tell. All jokes I like, I like playing with fire. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, like, blank, I'm just a blank canvas, mate. Yeah, yeah, quite boring. Yeah. If only you could look this way and see all the kids' toys and. Uh, <laughs> but Michael, yeah. I'll tell you what. But you're right. Yeah. That's that's a small snippet of your life, and quite remarkable, really. I mean, Emmanuel, as he said, he's an NLP practitioner, and I'm sure his mind's going crazy at the moment. You know, sort of thinking about the mindset that you had and the things that you did and the, the way that you helped other people and, and equal offenders. I'm sure he could spend all day here about the, the whole mindset behind that. But what, what gave you the drive to change yourself? Because it seems that no, there was nobody else there saying, apart from, you know, the, the care worker who said, you're going to jail. I don't know if that was a, a pivoting point in your life. It sounds like it was, but before that, you seem to want change. You know, where in your life did you decide, you know, gangs are not for me, this is for me, it's a new, it's a new way? Because I'm sure that there's a lot of people out there, and I, I know of a lot of people who have used lockdown to basically lock themselves down, eat as much as they can, drink as much as they can, get as much booze into themselves as they can. However, on the other side of it, there's people out there who've decided, right, I'm going to educate myself. I'm going to be a smarter, more more practical person, if you like, when lockdown finishes and I can make changes for me for my future. So where was where what made you change? I, I, I think it's a massive it, change. Yeah. I think, you know, growing up in care, there was nothing um uh, the the didn't recognise when I was in care dyslexia, and I, I just I, I was absolutely frustrated because I have it and I couldn't handle lessons, so there was nothing there for me. I couldn't see anything. I was very, you know, what what is it all about? There's nothing there for me. I'm the wrong. Don't please don't take this the wrong way, but. I'm the wrong colour because mm. this is the seventies. Um, I'd be classed as yeah, yeah. thick because yeah. I, I, I couldn't write. Um, there was just I grew up in care. There was nothing positive about what I was about, but you could quite easily fall into that route of everybody else of going out and committing crimes. When I was committing crimes, a few of the guys who, uh, I suppose we were the gang, uh, they they progressed onto drugs and also um, uh, bank robberies and shop robberies uh, with guns. Yeah. They progressed onto that, and I just couldn't see anything we stole. When you steal items and sell them on, you get probably a third of the value of it, no matter what it is. So there was just no future. Your future is you are going to be caught and you will be locked up. Um, yeah. At 17, being told you're going to prison was a very rude awakening for me. And I knew I had to get out of the environment I was in. I had to move on. I had to change my attitude and I suppose anything, you, you praise anybody, watch how they react. You run them down, watch how they react. If you're in work and you say to somebody, actually, Susan, what you've done there is fantastic. Such a good 
imagination or enthusiasm to go forward, mm. she's going to react a hell of a lot better than you're saying to her, if you do that again, stupid, you're out the door. Yeah. And yeah. the problem with us is we don't tend to look at what we're actually doing until we do it. And you're going to look at the reaction and you say, well, actually, that reaction is, I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that reaction. I, I'm not pushing this person forward. So I wanted to go forward. And the only person who was going to do it was me. But yeah. Yeah. don't get me wrong. I lived on and I starved for the appreciation that I received off my boss of yeah. when I did 100 frames, even though I woke up and thought, well, oh, Jesus Christ, they've just carpeted the office with new carpet because their dog doesn't like sitting on the liner. And that really <laughs> pissed me off because, sorry, I yeah. swore there, I, I couldn't get a rise out of him, and yet, yeah. He bought, they bought him a new car. They did the carpet in the office. And you could see the achievement. Luckily, my boss, even though he was a great guy, I respected him. And I did look at him as a father figure. I could see his lack of enthusiasm about what we were doing as a company. And my enthusiasm just grew and grew and grew. And... Mm -hmm. It's funny listening to the different aspects of you four. You, you know, you've gone on about we've got this, we do that, we do this, we do that. And I love that. It really is brilliant because you're pushing the right way. You're probably missing out on other things. I missed out, which I'm sad about, on my children growing up because I was too busy mm. trying to achieve. I had nothing else yeah. except in my mind that I needed yeah. to achieve all the time. And whatever that achievement was, I wanted to achieve more. Not greed, just achieve. When you come from a very low background and you get somewhere and you've achieved that, you want to do more in life and that's yeah. what I was about. So, so, so Michael, can, can I take you back? Because you have said lots of really interesting things and uh, just to really help the audience, there's a couple of things that you said I think were quite important to sort of drill down on. So a lot of your uh, other uh, comrades or, or fellows that were growing up with you at the same time, they all had a very similar experience to you growing up with the same disadvantages as you did. However, there was a turning point that Ashley was trying to get to. So in regards to that turning point, what was it that they said to you or happened that made you make a decision in that moment to make a change? Because they all went through the same as you did. They had all the same experiences that you did. You were in the same gang. So what did you say to yourself or what did they say to you at that moment that made you make a decision to take your life in a different direction? Because you said lots of things and... You know, I will pick up on bits later on in terms of the, the things that you've said in the NLP and what you've created within your own language patterns. But what, what did you say specifically to yourself or what was told to you that made you make that decision? Now I'm going to make a change. It, it, you've got to remember we were a gang, so we were together a lot. And that being together meant you were part of what they were about as well. And I can remember that we'd sit there and they'd be smoking weed and doing drugs. And um, luckily for me, I've got an addictive personality. So I wouldn't do drugs. I just couldn't do it. I was absolutely terrified. Couldn't even, you know, some people, I'm 60 now, but, I've been with people standing in the toilet and watching them. I've got OCD as well. God, I've got everything. That I've watched them <laughs> cut, cut the bloody coke up on the, on the top of the toilet yeah. and take a line. And I watched him do it. And number one, I couldn't take it off the toilet. And number two, I always looked at people who offered you drugs as the most evilest people ever going. I've always had that because they're not happy with dragging themselves down. They want to pull you with them. And yeah. I just didn't yeah. want to get into it. I was scared to death of um, 
trying, even trying any sort of drug. And yeah. you're watching these, these, these guys were all in a flat and we're all having, I, I was drinking alcohol, um, but I wouldn't do the drugs. And we had no life. We had nothing. All we had was each other. And there was no... That was your family, wasn't it? That was your family. That was, that yeah. was the family. But the yeah. family was nothing. You know, a highlight to them, oh, I got Susan pregnant. Oh, I think I did. Or it might have been Sammy who got her pregnant. I'm not sure. And even that little conversation, you'd be like, oh, my God, who knows who? Who, who, yeah. who actually knows? So when my social worker had said to me, you're going to prison, that had to alter everything in my life. Yeah. That was the first time I'd actually stood up and thought, no. I don't want to go to prison. I need to get a job. I need to get, I need to move forward. Mm. I had nothing. I had no qualifications, nothing. I had a boss who, um, it wasn't racist, but he was looking at me as if I was something like an alien. And I had to overcome this and be able to convince this guy, no, I'm serious. I've got to move mm. forward. I've got to try and be better. Now, you look at anybody taking on somebody who has a background of it's all gone wrong or they broke the law or they've been in trouble, you're reluctant to give that person a chance. And that is a very big thing to overcome. Once you've overcome it, great, you can move on. Luckily, I was in a position where I was that enthusiastic and focused. And when I say focused, Everything was blinkered. I was just mm. straight. Everything had to change. So you created your own luck. You said luckily, but you created your own luck. There, there was really no luck about it. It all came from your actions. There's a lot of luck in it. There is a lot of luck because, yeah. look, I was in the right position, the right place. Um, as I said, at 17, 18, um, my, I was going to leave the company I was working for because I was disheartened. I was yeah. hurt that I wasn't earning good money still, even though I was working as hard as I possibly could. And I'd been offered a job. So, my, my, Michael, can I just stop you there for a second? Because yeah, I think it's yeah, a little bit more than that. It wasn't that you wasn't earning enough money, if I hear you rightly. It wasn't that you were being acknowledged and recognised for the effort that you were contributing. And at the same time, they were getting other benefits for themselves and saying they couldn't afford to pay you more. So that's more or less what disheartened you because you no longer felt that you were in the same family anymore. Yes, very well, good way of putting, putting it. Uh. Hurt by the uh, – that's absolutely right because the one thing you we all do is we learn to trust and if we trust somebody and they break that trust, yeah. you, your, your, your respect for that person has gone. And my respect for my boss, even though he was like a father figure, it had gone. It had gone. Yeah. So yeah. with the other guys, the other guys what? in the gang, what did they go on to do? They, they went on to do bank do? robberies. Um, where, are they, cars. where are they now? Where are they now? Uh, some of them are out. Um, one of them, I do actually follow him on Facebook, is not into anything uh criminal. I don't talk, I just mm. follow what he does, and his life now revolves around his uh seeing his grandchildren. He hasn't done anything with his life, he's got a flat, a council flat. Um, and it's about seeing his grandchildren. Look, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just no, no, no. Yeah. just looking yeah. an, an insight into the rest of them got into trouble. I don't know where they are. I don't. I'm yeah. not in touch with them. I did know uh, a couple of them did go to prison for. Uh, I think it was something like 20 years for um, armed robbery. And I also know of. Um, one of them was involved in a shooting and he actually got stopped by the police with lasers all pointing at his body in the car. They didn't uh -huh. shoot him, but it mm. got that bad 
that they would have shot him, but he was actually doing crack cocaine at the time, so he wasn't aware of that. Yeah, yeah. well. And and now, now, Michael, what you know, fast forward, what what are you doing now with your life? I know you do lots of talks and stuff, but where do you invest your time, your, your money, and and what are the most important things to you now? Um, amazingly, I have a small business on the island, um, which does a bit of manufacturing and uh, supply, which I, I enjoy. I also do um, quite a bit of TV work where I, I do, you've heard of the gadget show. I test a lot of their yeah. systems, um, okay. security okay. systems. Uh, of course, I do a lot of talking and- I thought you were his dad. Really. Sorry? I thought you was his dad, Michael. Who? The guy from the gadget show. I thought you were his dad. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, give him that it, one. It's quite funny, actually. I, I, last night, um, I, I got a link into your, one of your videos, and I spent like the next hour and a half just watching video after video after video after video. It's quite interesting. Because when I was coming on, I had an impression of what we were going to be talking about. And this has totally gone the other opposite direction, which actually has gone yeah. in a good way. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. So obviously I was watching a lot of the Beat the Burglar and those sort of things and the advice you gave on, you know, you know, lock this, don't lock that, don't use this 2008 lock or before that or, you know, and all yeah. this sort of, you know, things. But, um, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting to get behind the scenes of what you might see as the, the, the TV personality into mm. actually the history, and, you know. And, and, you know, from that that persona I, I actually thought you had been in prison and you'd been you know and that was the sort of background i didn't realize the you know this other stuff it's been interesting so yeah i mean congratulations on turning that around and really embracing success and yeah it's awesome so i was going to say there's a saying success leaves clues and what you've shared today have been absolutely golden nuggets for anybody starting off in life at any position to take those nuggets and to see what it takes to be successful your dedication, your focus, your tenacity, your OCD, all of those actually helping and, and you making a contribution. There's so many golden nuggets that you've laid out today that when people listen back to this, if they listen to it a few times, they will see the formula to the success that you've created because success doesn't happen overnight. It happens through a journey and you've shown that. And, you know, although you said you haven't, you know, you, there was luck, there wasn't luck. You created the luck. Luck is when opportunity, when prepared, this recognises opportunity. You were prepared, you recognised it, and you embraced it with both hands, and you drove it forward. So don't let anybody tell you differently. You created your own luck, and, you know, pat yourself on the back, mate. That was a, a brilliant, you know, amazing story, and love you for sharing it. Thank yeah. you. What, what uh, is the most, what's I, the most... Sorry, go on, Brett. So I should yeah, so I should say I thought it was interesting that you you sort of brushed over from the seventeen to the millionaire, but I'm sure that period was actually a pretty hard period of your life. You know, I mean, there would have been a lot of lessons through that time. Yeah, it was twenty four seven because yeah. the more achievement you made, the better you wanted to. Uh, yeah. the, the drive is is just immense. The drive in me to to see and. It's really funny. The it's it's I suppose it, it, it could be construed construed really as people look at you differently. If you are successful, people are more likely to respect you and uh, listen to what you've got to say than you being somebody who just works in a factory. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I just, everything about what I do and what people, how they look at you, it changed. It just changed. It wasn't, I, look, I've got regrets growing up from that time. My children did really grow up without me because I was constantly into work. And I noticed that even gatherings, and it's so hard for me, even now, 
it's so hard to me to sit there talking about daffodils or the ducks in the park. I'd rather discuss <laughs> being successful about doing something. And I still have that Good. sort of, um, I, I don't, it's really difficult. You know, I say, someone will say, oh, you know, Sarah down the road, it's really sad. Her dog has died. And I'll say, yeah, but she could just go and buy another one. Now, it, part of it is in my <laughs> sense of humour. <laughs> go and buy another say, one. It? <laughs> it's like, look, people, and, and we do, a lot of people are lonely that do need a pet. And that's good. And I know people do that. But I, I just think it, it's a lack of, I didn't grow up with that. I didn't grow up with the, mm. my dad, he came over here in the 50s into the UK. He worked hard in a factory. He used to have, it used to be called a blues party and they used to have them. Jamaicans have them on a Friday and Saturday. And what they would do is uh, he would have all his friends around the house that would buy alcohol off him and they would have a party in the house. So he'd make a fortune at doing that. Now he made a lot of money doing that. He was, I, I think I have his drive he wasn't accepted here. He was always in trouble and he went back to Jamaica and he actually got killed in a car crash. Now he was lying in the car and the people who crashed into him didn't go to him and help. They emptied his pockets, but that's what you would expect in Jamaica. And he died. Now that to me was like, wow, you know, that is part of what happens and I'm, I'm more, I don't know, I, I still have that drive. I still have that, mm. that thing where I still do a lot to help people. If, you know, yeah. if someone is yeah. in trouble or I don't really have a lot of time for people who don't try or they play on the sympathy because I used to play on the sympathy and care. You know, you'd be a children's home. Yeah. You haven't got parents. You're the one there at Christmas on your own because everyone's gone home. And you used to think, Jesus. And I always wanted to be adopted, and that never happened uh, because I was unruly. I wasn't really fit to go into wow. someone's home. So it, it, difficulties, you can overcome them. It's just if you want to. Yeah. That's the yeah. key. That's the key. Mm. Everyone has a choice, and and but you can't make someone change. They no. have to want to change. No, I agree. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Well, Michael, it's been. I'm I'm conscious of time. It's been fantastic listening to your story. Very inspirational. What you now? Just to end before the boys sort of ask any final question is, what what would you? I mean, we've all got kids, all of us on here. You know. Our kids live a, a pretty good life now because of the hard work that we put in. However, I know that we all teach them that this is not just given to you on a plate. You're still going to work for it. And there are kids out there, in you know, especially with COVID, who are in much less privileged homes and these type of things. And there's teenagers who are coming out of school and it's harder to get jobs and harder to get houses, apparently. What would, what would you say to a group of these kids now listening, thinking, how can I, how can I do that when all seems so impossible? I I have this thing, everything can seem impossible, but if you work hard and you're trying to overcome the impossible as such, you're going to be Mm. successful no matter what, because it's not just you, it's the people watching what you are doing to overcome that problem in your life. And it's them that will help and guide you to go forward. Mm. We're all parents, believe it or not. How many children look at their parents without their parents realizing it? And they're looking at them because they're thinking, well, my dad does it this way. It Mm. must be right because he does do it that way. And you're so true. Your your situation with your child, as they get older, they do realise no matter what, 
their parents are only guiding them the best possible way they know how to do it. And they're the only ones who will ever do that for them. And they will learn that. They will learn that yeah. because they're watching all the time. Thanks, Michael. That's awesome. Um, Brett, Emmanuel, any final questions yeah. or comments? It's, it's been a real pleasure to hear a yeah. story. There's been some amazing gems and nuggets in there. Uh, I'm, I'm going to listen back to it. There's, there's some gems that people will learn. And you've taken mm -hmm. every bit of adversity that you've had and turned it into a positive uh, mm -hmm. where other people could take that adversity and go one way. You've turned it completely the other way. So, mate, yeah. story. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, thank you. 100%. Not a problem. The only thing is we thank haven't talked much. about security. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You know, it's. I'm sure that everyone can watch your shows on YouTube <laughs> and beat the burger and catch up and now. Now, so, so the, the, the only thing, the only thing certain in life, there is no security. Security doesn't make us safe; it just gives us an illusion. But when it comes to locks, you're the man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Changing well, quickly. All of us here, I can vouch for all of us, have learned so much more about life skills and and the golden nuggets that and the manual mentioned. I'm sure that will yeah. will help a load of people out there. Give them this inspiration, especially in you know, lockdown and all the mental health that's going yeah. on and yeah. make it will give people such a big positive boost. So thank yeah. you from behalf of everyone out there listening.